Welcome to Free Speech Nation, the podcast with me, Andrew Doyle. I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, George Galloway. Uh, George is a politician, writer and broadcaster. He is the leader of the Workers' Party of Great Britain. He has sat in Parliament as a Labour MP and also as an MP for the Respect Party, which he led. He joined the Labour Party when he was 13 uh, and was eventually expelled by Tony Blair in 2003 due to his opposition to the Iraq War. He was lauded by Tony Benn as one of our finest socialists, internationalists and Democrats of his generation. One of the things that I wanted to start with is, is just to let you know how I first uh, heard of you. And this is going back to 2006 and I was a young teacher and you were on um, Celebrity Big Brother. Um, and I remember at the time you saying that your reason for going on that show was because you wanted to get your message out there um, to younger people. Um, and that was uh, unheard of, really, at the time. I don't think um, politicians just weren't really doing that. Uh, do you think it, it paid off, ultimately? Uh, in a way, uh, I mean, uh, the Channel 4 birdsonged out most of my long treatises on the public sector borrowing requirement in Peru or the situation in uh, inner Mongolia. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't get those messages out. But I did become, as it were, a figure amongst young people. Uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of older people didn't like it. But a lot of younger people did. And those younger people are now voters. And I meet people all the time who say to me what you have just said, uh, that they first became aware of me uh, on Celebrity Big Brother. Uh, the uh, team that we had in the house on that occasion uh, was unparalleled in its uh, dazzling brilliance. It's, uh, it's become iconic, that house. Some of uh, the great wits, like, uh, like Pete Burns, for example, uh, now sadly no longer with us, uh, were brought to the fore uh, in front of people. I described them at the time as a cross between Oscar Wilde and Dorothy Parker. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I was overstating it. He was coruscatingly brilliant. Uh, Dennis Rodman, the uh, great basketball player, now often to be found in Pyongyang, uh, was another one. And there were many others. So it was a, quite an epic 22 days in my life. I raised a very great deal of money for charity by being there and doing what I had to do there. Uh, I wouldn't do it again, but I don't regret doing it. Yes, it feels like a very much a different time back then. I mean, you mentioned the uh, the coruscating wit of Pete Burns. Sometimes he could be, uh, I mean, not just waspish and very, very funny and very talented, but also e extremely offensive in his humour to an extent that I, I don't know if someone like that would feature in a reality TV show today. I feel like there is a nervousness around eccentric creative people. Do you think I'm right about that? You're absolutely right. He'd be banned. He'd be cancelled. Uh, without a doubt, uh, no, because yes, his, uh, his humor was frequently cruel. Uh, and there we were, uh, all kinds of oddballs, me included, locked up uh, without any uh, sensory perception, without access to anything from outside. Uh, it was a weird cocoon. Uh, and uh, cruelty was, was almost inevitable, uh, as was conflict uh, between uh, the parties. Uh, but we were all willing parties. Uh, we were all uh, consenting adults. Uh, so uh, I think it was pretty overwhelmingly uh, enjoyed. Uh, but you're right, in today's snowflake culture, uh, Pete Burns would be a non-person long, long ago. Well, this is something I really wanted to talk to you about because I know that you yourself have been physically attacked, actually, by, by activists on, on a university campus. Um, and I think there is a, uh, a sense in which, and, and I don't think it is just the younger generation, I think there is a kind of broader attitudinal shift where people feel that, um, that they need to really police the kinds of opinions or sentiments that be, are being expressed by other people. And uh, they can even sometimes do this in, in, with, with violence. Can, can you tell us a little about what happened to you and what, you, what your thoughts were on that? I, I mean, I was, first of all, no platformed by the National Union of Students uh, because of my support for Julian Assange in the uh, fake allegations, as they 
turned out to be, and as I already knew them to be, uh, of uh, sexual nature in Sweden. Uh, and I, I, I had only just made a comeback and in the faraway uh, Northern University of Aberdeen. Uh, I was giving a talk uh, about the world. It was quite a good one, if I say so myself. A very large audience was uh, quite transfixed by what I was saying. Uh, when I saw a group uh, of, uh, how shall I put it, rowdies uh, advancing on me, and they uh, threw uh, powder in my face. I, of course, had no way of knowing for some minutes what that powder was. Uh, it was ingested by me. It was in my eyes. Uh, and it was an attempt to halt the meeting by a group that later uh, described themselves as trans campaigners. Now, the funny thing is, at that time, I had never uttered a single word about that issue ever in public or in private, actually. I had no view uh, on it, uh, but they must have been clairvoyant uh, because I have come to regard this trans mania as uh, one of the leading sources of the kind of trouble you are describing. Uh, no, where did one they is, any, Did they give any suggestion as to what their complaint with you was at all? No, uh, just that I was well-known, prominent. Uh, I think I was a member of parliament at the time. Uh, it had no other purpose than that. It could not have been punishment for any transgression, for transgress I had not, at least at that stage. But I now realize uh, that this transmania is one of the ways in which uh, the virtue signalers uh, test us. Uh, they require us uh, to call mothers people. Uh, they require us to call breastfeeding chest feeding. And they require us to believe uh, that a man can become a woman uh, merely by declaration, and that that becomes a literal fact. Uh, when, of course, this flies in the face of all reason, all science, all biology, all common sense, uh, and yet one can be, and many have been, literally cancelled from public life, and then uh, subject to an unending stream of abuse, in the case of J.K. Rowling, even promises of pipe bombs in the post. Uh, so it was a, a harbinger. You know that Marx said that a, a, a small cloud, no bigger than a man's hand, uh, can be a harbinger of great storms to come. Uh, well, that puff of powder thrown in my face at Aberdeen University was indeed a harbinger of great storms to come. And I think I should clarify uh, that there's a distinction between what you're describing, which is gender self-identification and, and uh, trans people generally, because I think there's a, a lot of confusion about this. What you're objecting to is the denial of biological reality. Um, right. and, and, you know, in fact, of course, a lot of trans people would agree with you on this. I remember specifically the trans writer Blair White has said, if there's no such thing as biological sex, there is no such thing as trans. And what you're saying is to deny the reality, the observable reality, that there are differences between men and women, and one cannot simply flip between the two uh, due to a declaration, uh, that, 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 that should not be a controversial statement to make. And yet it can get you in an awful lot of trouble these days. So, uh, listen, Andrew, I have kissed a trans woman who was a man when I knew him first. I shook him warmly by the hand every time I met him. When he became uh, uh, a self-identifying woman, I kissed him on both cheeks uh, and treated him exactly as he wished to be treated. And then, as it happens, he he, he uh, uh, transited back again, and I took to shaking him warmly by the hand. I treat people as uh, they wish to be treated. Uh, but don't put my feet to the fire and ask me to accept uh, that that person or any other person has literally become a woman merely by declaring so. 
Why do you think it is the case that this has become such a hot topic even in politics? I mean, I, I think about the SNP have, have torn themselves apart over this with Joanna Cherry. Uh, the Green Party recently have had similar problems with the, the, uh, the, the leader resigning, Sean Berry resigning over, over these, these concerns. Um, and now Labour increasingly uh, seems to be a little obsessed with this issue that, let's be honest, only affects a very, very small uh, minority of the, of the population. Do they not see uh, how this could potentially play out in electoral terms and it won't be in their favour? Oh, I, I wish I knew the answer to your question. I really don't. It's one of the great mysteries. Sometimes I put it down to my advancing years uh, that maybe there's something I'm just not quite getting. Uh, but I'm unable to answer it. What I am clear about, though, is that it has captured a very great deal of uh, public and institutional space, including um, perhaps particularly in the Labour Party, uh, where it has literally become a trans mania and apparently uh, careless of its uh, electoral impact. Uh, it has uh, taken over the upper reaches of the Labour Party, presumably because it had already taken over the lower reaches. And now the Labour Party, as a choir, sings off the same hymn sheet on this. Their problem is that it's not a hymn sheet recognised uh, by the vast majority of Labour voters, the vast majority of British people. Uh, be, uh, and they appear to be unconcerned uh, about that and are rapidly disappearing up their own fundament as they are discovering uh, north of the, the so-called Red Wall. Uh, yes. It's one of the reasons why the Labour Party, having fallen out of love with the British people, is finding that reciprocated in equal measure. Yes, I mean, I think I think history teaches us that when when the left um, plays identity politics in this way, it doesn't work out well electorally. I think it, when the right does it, it can work. And, and if they if they push a a, 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 a populist nationalist uh, agenda, that can uh, translate into votes. But I, but I, I I see evidence again and again. I mean, Hillary Clinton dividing the electorate up, saying, you know, I'll help the women, I'll help the Latinos, I'll help the gay people. But that doesn't convey a message of unity. And uh, it certainly doesn't address the issue of poverty, of economic inequality, which, after all, is what a lot of the people, particularly in those red wall seats, r really care about, surely. Yes, uh, the, the whole purpose of a political party is to win power and therefore consciously to embark on a series of narratives that make it increasingly unlikely that you will ever attain power uh, is not just pointless in terms of your own activity, but of course a betrayal of the very people you say you want to help, because without winning power, how can you help Latinos, gay people, or all the other non-deplorables that Hillary Clinton adumbrated? You obviously cannot. So uh, not pursuing unity is not just a good thing in itself, it's much more likely to lead to victory and the kind of changes that you presumably want to make. It's not rocket science, you know. It used to be ABC uh, of Labour politics. I spent uh, 36 years in the Labour Party. And for most of that time, it was ABC. But now I'm afraid it isn't. Do you have any idea why uh, the left in this country seem to have, I mean, certainly from my perception, seem to have abandoned the class struggle or any notion of, 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 of that being a priority for these identity issues. Why that happened and, and how, how they can get back on track, because clearly it's not working out well for them. Well, I saw it happen. I was there. Uh, I always joke that I, I knew things had started to go wrong when trade union schools uh, were forced to sit in a circle uh, rather than in serried ranks, listening to experts and asking questions of those experts. Uh, we went into the circular motion and Mr. Tony Benn was no more or less important 
than Mr. Joe Bloggs in the circle with him. I used to identify that as the moment when things started to go wrong. And they've been going wrong for 40 years. Uh, since the, uh, the defeat, heavy defeat, ideological and political and electoral defeat uh, of Labour in 1979, the triumph of Thatcherism, led to a collapse of confidence uh, in the British Labour movement in their project. Uh, they ceased, increasingly ceased to believe in it and uh, were um, seduced in, uh, by a wily uh, Frenchman called Jacques Delors, uh, who persuaded them that uh, Delorism could blunt the sharp edges of Thatcherism. And thus began uh, the transformation of the left's attitude to the European Union. We had been viscerally hostile to the common market, then the European Union, prior to that time. But we were increasingly seduced uh, by Monsieur Delors, who's still alive, by the way, in his late 90s. Uh, and Delorism is 30 years dead because, of course, it didn't survive uh, the ravages uh, of uh, Thatcher Reaganomics. But it, it survived long enough. Uh, to distort and uh, and uh, seduce off the path of opposition to the European Union, uh, of the British left, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, seemed also to confirm uh, that socialism as a project, as an idea, uh, was doomed. And uh, it's all been downhill uh, since then. Uh, Mr. Blair capitalized on that lack of confidence persuaded those people uh, that only his kind of politics could lead Labour back to power. And that happened, uh, but it was nothing that was recognisable as Labour that was produced as a result. It's very interesting that you you identify this shift going back many decades. For a lot of us, it does feel like this has all happened very rapidly over, over the past between five and ten years with the rise of the, the sort of identitarian left. But we, you're, you seem to be tying this into a more generalised um, move away from a traditional left wing thought within the party. I mean, I know Blair never described himself as left wing, did he? So he he wouldn't have said that. Um, but you seem to think that this is connected. Or am I right? In getting the, am I getting this right? That you think. The rise of sort of identity politics rather than class politics is is deeply connected to, for example, um, uh, the Labour's love affair with the European Union. And as you said yourself, they used to run on manifestos saying that they would get us out of the common market. We did in 1983. Michael Foote's manifesto uh, explicitly stated that we would leave the European Union. I see it as having come like so many other bad things from the United States. I called it uh, long ago the Californiaization uh, of, uh, of left-wing politics, mm -hmm. the triumph of, uh, of identity, uh, of individualism, uh, the abandonment of the collectivism that is implicit in what Mr. Ben used to call socialism with a hyphen, uh, the, uh, the triumph of the individual, me, my color, my sexual orientation, uh, my gender, uh, my whatever it is. Uh, this, I think, uh, hegemony of individualism uh, began in the late 1970s, in the early 1980s. And as I say, I was there. Um, and it's all been a lamentable failure because, of course, nobody has been liberated hmm. by this, uh, this triumph of uh, individualism. Identity politics has liberated nobody. Everyone's in exactly the same place they were in relation to wealth and power uh, uh, than they were at the start of it, of it all. And the purpose of politics is to change Yes. Uh, one's uh, relationship to wealth and power. And that simply hasn't happened. We are yeah. less mobile uh, in class terms than we were before. It's harder to get somewhere to live that you can afford to live in than it was before. It's harder to get a job that is secure with decent conditions 
and wages than it was before. Everything is worse than it was before. So the project has failed. Some critics would, would say, well, isn't uh, class politics a form of identity politics in a way? But, you know, I think there, are, there is something very tangible about not having money and what that means for your prospects in society. Quite so. Uh, to have your sexual orientation uh, um, honoured by someone waving a, a, a rainbow flag or to have your colour uh, honoured uh, by someone choosing their words. Uh, far more carefully, uh, to have your position on the personal pronouns uh, uh, recognized, doesn't put any potatoes on the plate, uh, doesn't pay the rent, uh, doesn't protect you from uh, unfair dismissal uh, or exploitation. Uh, all of these things have gotten far worse. Uh, so, of course, uh, class is an identity, but it's the big identity. It's the big enchilada. Uh, and if people of all colors, orientations, creeds, religions, united under the banner of their relationship to wealth and power, well, apart from anything else, there would be far more of us uh, because the vast majority of us are working class. How do we define working class? Thus, if you depend on your labor to live, then you are working class. If losing your wages or your salary for a few weeks, a couple of months would plunge you into penury, you sure are working class. It's interesting to hear you say this because I've, I've been reading a lot of um, the identitarian left's books and articles about these various issues. I say left, I don't, I don't really consider them to be left-wing authentic. Liberals, the, the, I call them liberals with a small l. Right, I mean, they, they, they certainly don't care about class. And in fact, Robin DiAngelo, who wrote a book called White Fragility, which I, I'm, I don't know if you've read, but if you haven't, you're very lucky. Um, she actually explicitly says that for people to say that class is ultimately more important than uh, racial identity is a form of white supremacy in it itself. That's how she puts it. What would you make of that kind of argument? It's perfectly absurd. Uh, if we all celebrated Black History Month and we all um, prayed nightly to Marcus Garvey, if that left all the black people in Britain economically insecure, insecure housing, uh, increasingly on low wages, zero hour contracts, bereft of all economic protection. How would that profit anyone? Yeah. So what do we do to, because I do feel like it's, it's a tsunami now of identity politics that, is, that has taken hold of the left or, or what we used to call the left. Is it possible now at this point uh, for the left to get back on track or is it just the case that to be left now means something very different than it used to? Well, if what they stand for is left, I'm not left. Uh, I don't uh, any longer describe myself as left. I'm a socialist, uh, full stop. Uh, I don't want to be identified with uh, the screaming abdabs of what uh, is called the left nowadays. People hate it. And I don't want them to hate me. I don't want them to hate what I stand for. Is that, I don't is want that, them. Is that surrendering too much power to these people, though? In a sense, it, you know, there's there's a, a long, long tradition of what it means to be on the left, and and for for these sort of very um, vocal, uh, aggressive people to come along and say, no, we're going to seize what it means to be left, and what it means to be left is to talk about pronouns and and the, the, those various uh, niche issues. Uh, aren't you giving them? I suppose, too much credit by, by surrendering the term. Well, I, I think they have captured all the citadels. Even the right. TUC uh, is, uh, is achingly uh, politically correct and identitarian now. Uh, and the Labour Party is long gone. Uh, increasingly, trade unions uh, are basically service providers uh, infused with, uh, with liberalism. I always say that Trotskyism and liber liberalism are two sides of the same coin. And these citadels of which I speak are controlled uh, by uh, this coin uh, of which uh, Trotskyism 
is the is the less important side. They are effectively liberals. I'm at war today, for example, on Twitter uh, on the issue of uh, of uh, immigration and uh, asylum seekers, merely for pointing out uh, that a migrant and an asylum seeker are not the same thing. Uh, that every country, if it is a country, if it is a state, uh, has to control its own borders, or it is not a state. Uh, and the only Trotskyites, liberals, and capitalist oligarchs uh, support open borders. Uh, the rest of us, which is the great majority of us, realize that that would be ruinous. Uh, I'm, of course, also making it clear uh, that uh, every country, including our own, especially our own, given our involvement in the wars of the 21st century, has a legal and moral obligation to take its fair share of genuine refugees. But that, that is a separate question, and these two categories should not be mixed up. I'm at war with what uh, passes for the left on Twitter today on this subject, but what they are actually expressing is not leftism, but liberalism, although none of them would let uh, refugees in to open their fridge and eat what they've got there, of course. Uh, refugees are something that somebody else uh, has to take responsibility for. So, no, I don't think I'm uh, abandoning the field. I'm just redefining what it means to be a socialist. Socialism and liberalism are different things. I myself have never been liberal. So I, I, am, I am socially conservative in I'm many, right. many respects. You see, I have, a, I have different views of, of liberal values to me, to me are values such as uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, individual autonomy, uh, you know, tolerance of, of, of uh, people having different lifestyles and different views. Is that not what liberalism is or are you coming at it from a different angle? Well, I think the today's liberals are entirely illiberal. Uh, right. they, they, they would cancel you uh, and cancel right. me. <laughs> so there's nothing liberal, there's nothing more illiberal uh, than a 21st century liberal. This is my problem is that the language seems to have got so messed up is that people who define themselves as liberal, as liberal are not liberal by any definition of the term that I understand it. And similarly, the people who tell me that they are on the left uh, seem to be uh, screaming about identity issues when they could be focusing on class issues, often at the expense of class issues. So when the language is so muddled, um, how can we possibly make any progress at all? They, they, they are at odds with class. I mean, identity politics is antithetical to class politics. Let's take, uh, um, let's take a, a notional or mythical industrial dispute. If you only accepted on your picket line, if you were only in solidarity with those workers and supporters who got their pronouns right, who had uh, absolutely flawless ideas about sexual politics, racial politics, and so on, you'd be standing on that picket line more or less on your own. Uh, class politics requires everyone to put second those things uh, that would divide the collective. The collective is more important from someone like me, I, ex I accept probably not someone like you, but the collective is more important than the individual because the individual uh, can only truly be free once the collective has redressed the imbalance of power uh, that exists in capitalist society. No individual can liberate themselves against overwhelming odds, but all the individuals collected together can do. Uh, it's an old slogan, it's a hundred years old and more, that, that unity is strength, uh, that united we stand, divided we fall. And too many people on the left spend too much time making sure that we're as divided as we can possibly be. I think that's right. As, as so many of the sort of inclusivity measures and initiatives that seem to come up seem to create an awful lot of division. They seem to do the opposite of what they what they claim to do. And I, I, you know, I'm thinking even this week with the uh, 
the Scottish civil service sort of encouraging their staff to, to sign off their emails with their pronouns. And of course, 60% of the staff have said they have no intention of, of, of doing this because they don't want to be forced into a position where they have to express support for an ideology that they don't necessarily support. So all of this just seems, I suppose, deeply counterproductive to any truly uh, left-wing agenda. Exactly. What was achieved by this demarche, uh, by the supposedly progressive uh, SNP-controlled civil service uh, in Holyrood? Uh, nothing. The opposite uh, of anything good was achieved. Uh, I'm so old-fashioned, Andrew, I suggested the use of Mr., Mrs., Miss, or Ms. might have solved this entire problem. Uh, but people said that made me uh, um, prehistoric <laughs> well, in my you see, attitude. You, you touch on something here, and you mentioned it earlier with your image of the, the empty picket line, is that there seems to be a tendency among many of these activists, and not just activists, but those who have captured the institutions that, that you mentioned, to demand a kind of moral purity, but it's their particular vision of what it means to be moral. And unless you are using the right words, uh, unless you have the right opinions, they're very resistant to the idea of debating difference and, 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 and treating people with different views with, with respect. Rather, they would, they would want to see them as, as evil, uh, as entities that need to be purged from society. This is, to me, again, I, I think this is just fundamentally counterproductive. Do you think this is something that's always been there in the left? Is this a new thing that has just come along with this identitarian movement? It's a, it's a variant of sectarianism, that's true. Uh, I used to, long ago, uh, look at some of my colleagues and thank God that they didn't have guns, uh, because if they had guns, uh, a lot of people, including myself, might well have been dead. Uh, so it may be uh, something that is uh, in the genes uh, of uh, people who identify as leftists. I mean, just this very day, uh, this is an obscure point, but it matters to me, uh, a leading official of the trade union, uh, CWU, the Postal Workers Union, uh, which I have literally <laughs> stood on picket lines, marched, uh, given support on all platforms, including in Parliament too, called me a C-U-N-T uh, because of my uh, argument I was talking about earlier about the difference between migrants and uh, asylum seekers. Uh, now, this man who did this uh, knows very well my history with the trade unions, and in particular his own trade union, mm. and yet can uh, talk to me publicly in that way. Uh, so there is uh, intolerance, uh, there is vehemence, there is a narcissism of the small difference. All of that is present on the left more uh, perhaps than it is uh, elsewhere on the political spectrum, and it's a deeply unpleasant thing. Well, that, well, that's it. And also, I don't think it's a, a very good persuasive tactic to call someone the word that you just spelt out for us. I don't think that's ever going to persuade someone. And I know there's, I, I recognise there's always been robust language in politics, and I understand that it can get, it can get pretty ugly at times. Um, but I just don't know how helpful it is. I mean, I go back to even Nye, Nye Bevan. Didn't he refer to conservatives as vermin? Uh, uh, rather famously, and I, I and for all, I, I have great admiration for, for for Bevin, but I don't know how helpful that is. And I, you know, I had my own experience uh, last week when um, Owen Jones uh, contacted me on Twitter. Well, he made a public declaration to challenge me to a discussion, but it was such a rude and 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 snarky approach. And I, you know, I would I have nothing against him. I would be delighted to talk to him. But if someone invites me politely, I'll go. But if they just insult me from the outset then I'm not going to appear on that show. And, and so it's counterproductive. Therefore, a conversation hasn't happened, which could have happened if you'd have taken a more adult approach. Well, as you said to me uh, about D'Angelo's uh, book, uh, you're lucky that you have escaped this encounter uh, with Mr. <laughs> Owen Jones, because okay. he is one of the most vituperative, uh, viperous, uh, practitioners of this kind of uh, politics. And he's very easily shot down. So, for example, uh, for reasons I won't bore you with, which are all to do with my opposition to the SNP and separatism, uh, I, for the first time in my life, uh, in May, uh, voted for the conservative candidate, 
in my constituency because it was him or the SNP. So Owen Jones, uh, with his broken bottle in the face approach, uh, interviews me and declares uh, uh, in a pronunciamento uh, that he could never, under any circumstances, vote for a conservative. I, my rejoinder was, but you would vote for Macron against Marine Le Pen. And therefore, you would, in those circumstances, vote for a conservative to defeat Marine Le Pen, the candidate of the uh, Front National, as used to be called. Uh, so uh, actually, their arguments, uh, their fanaticism, uh, is easily torn through, uh, but you have to suffer the yeah. slings and arrows of sitting down uh, with uh, Owen Jones. You've had a narrow escape, my friend. I, I would be more than happy to do it, but you know, on, on principle, I'm not going to go along if someone uh, insults me as a form of invitation. I don't, I don't think that would be a very dignified thing to do. But it is interesting what you say because it sounds to me like that, that commentators of his kind are very much caught up in a kind of tribalism. Uh, yeah. and, it, and it seems quite blinkered anyway, because the very same people who say they'll never vote Conservative uh, are uh, positive enthusiasts for the EU to the extent that they will paint their face uh, with the with the flag uh, colours. And of course, many of the prominent figures in the EU are, are well, at least centre-right. Uh, the top officials at the EU in Brussels, all of them are Conservatives. So, so how did that? Ha I mean, this is something I, I do want to get onto because I'm fascinated by the way in which you know, if you think of the great the luminaries of the left, like, such as Tony Benn, and Barbara Castle, and the people who were, were just fundamentally opposed to the EU on on many grounds, but above all, it is uh, a, a neoliberal pro corporate body set up by the super rich to protect the interests of the super rich, and yet we see people who identify as left. Uh, so how did that happen? Is what I'm getting. How did the how did yeah. You see, for me, if you support the EU, you are not left. Uh, that, though, is a very unpopular view. The vast majority of people, vast majority of people who consider themselves left, supported the EU. It's as if uh, Mr. Ben had never lived. Uh, and one imagines, I mean, in a way, I'm glad he was spared uh, the kind of invective thrown at the very few people recognizably uh, on the left, like me, uh, who fought for Brexit. I mean, there is no name that I was not called mm. uh, from racist to fascist. Imagine. This is exactly uh, what I mean about the, 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 the insults and the mudslinging that has uh, become sort of just a substitute for serious political debate. We, could, we absolutely can't get anywhere with, with, in this situation. And I, do, I did want to ask you what you thought Tony Benn would have made of all this, because I imagine he might have ended up being called a fascist as well. well I, I regret to say he, he would have been. Uh, uh, and when people said to me, well, you stood on a platform once, once, with Nigel Farage, I had to remind them that in the days when I was Mr. Benn's tea boy, and carrying his tobacco pouch, he was sitting on platforms with Enoch Powell. So the idea that because you're on a stage with someone in a binary referendum, uh, that that uh, justifies dispatching you to perdition hmm. uh, is absurd. Well, this, this strikes me as, as an extension of the social media mindset, where if yeah. you, for instance, uh, retweet or like a tweet by someone else, you are automatically uh, tainted by association with everything else that person has ever said. It's happened I've to done, yeah. it's, it's happened to Rosie Duffield this this week. It was a tweet that yeah. she liked, not even a tweet that she wrote. Uh, and I've seen lots of people put screenshots up of the the account that she'd liked and said, "Oh, I suppose you support all of this as well." I mean, this is, I suppose, what I mean is. When, when the, the world of social media, if it was just contained on social media, that would be one thing. But the, the behaviour of people online has now, now has sort of seeped out into Parliament. It's how politicians behave. It is, I suppose, what I'm talking about is the infantilization of politics. It is infantilization, and it's uh, practically unrecognisable to me now. Uh, I entered Parliament more than 30 years ago, uh, and uh, when I did, uh, the House was full of very different political beasts indeed uh, to those that inhabit that jungle today. 
the you you could still years after I went in there walk along a corridor and your head would turn as a significant figure uh, went by. Uh, there were, for example, uh, hundreds uh, of people who had come from real life occupations in Parliament when I entered it more than 30 years ago. People who'd been in the army, who'd fought in the war, uh, people who'd built businesses, people who had been trade union officials, uh, people who had been uh, rank and file trade unionists were there in significant numbers. None of that is true anymore. Uh, the uh, political world got smaller. Um, I hate to sound like Greta Garbo, but uh, I'm still big. It's the picture that got smaller. Uh, the political class got smaller. Uh, and someone like Mr. Ben, uh, or Powell for that matter, uh, or some of the big beasts that were in Parliament at that time, would not recognize the House of Commons that we have today. Uh, if it's not politically incorrect to say it, we have a political class which is dwarfish, and the robes hang loose uh, about their shoulders. Uh, it shows. Some of it might be down to an awful lot of careerism rather than genuinely vocational politics, but but that might be an unfair uh, supposition on my part. But I do uh, wonder, I mean, I know that you obviously recently ran uh, for Batley and Spen, and you ran very much a campaign on the basis of getting rid of Keir Starmer. Um, do, do you think that he is really uh, the, the, the key problem with Labour at the moment, or do you think it's much bigger than that? Getting rid of Keir Starmer only to put in another Taylor's dummy uh, with the same politics would be uh, next to pointless. I should say that I was being rather selfless because the best thing for me and the workers party that i lead is for keir starmer to stay stay as long as possible the labor is losing 250 members per day mm -hmm. and is now uh on the verge uh, of insolvency uh financially as well as Politically. Why was Keir Starmer even chosen as leader? Given, given someone who was so sort of instrumental behind the idea of a, a second referendum or, or Labour's support of a second referendum in their manifesto, I mean, surely, given that 70% of Labour constituencies voted leave, this was only ever going to end one way, wasn't it? Quite so. Uh, the lunatics uh, have taken over the asylum. Uh, the man chiefly responsible for the policy, chiefly uh, responsible for Labour's cataclysmic defeat, uh, was given the top job as, as a reward. You really couldn't make it up. Uh, it's one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Uh, but that's what happened. And that uh, person, uh, chiefly responsible for the uh, disastrous policy towards Brexit, has now purged the party, front bench first and then the ranks, uh, of uh, those uh, that uh, stood against him, even those, even though some of them are equally responsible for the blunder. I mean, Diane Abbott was as gung ho for Keir Starmer's uh, Brexit policy as Keir himself. That, that decision was really fatal because I think when people feel that their vote doesn't count, that the government will just attempt to completely trash it and ignore it. You know, people ultimately in this country, I think, uh, still care about democracy. It's one of the main reasons why we voted to leave the EU, surely. You know, they were unaccountable. They, you couldn't get them, you couldn't get rid of them. And the, the famous question that Tony Benn posed, how do we get rid of those in power? And you couldn't do it, you know? So this was, this, is, this, is this a blunder that, that Labour can never come back from? I don't think so, because it was, it was not the beginning of the alienation of the mm -hmm. traditional Labour voters. Uh, in a way, it merely crystallized uh, what had been this long period that I spoke of, uh, of Labour becoming, if I can use the word, foreign uh, to uh, the British people, uh, not liking them very much, not liking the way they talked, the way they thought, uh, their cultural, social uh, attitudes, which were increasingly, massively at odds with those that ran the Labour Party. The Labour Party, when I joined it, I know uh, it sounds impossible to believe, uh, but I joined the Labour Party 
in 1967. And the Labour Party in 1967 is unrecognisable uh, to the Labour Party I was kicked out of uh, nearly 20 years ago, never mind the Labour Party today. Uh, the Labour Party today does not look like, think like, talk like, act like, vote like uh, the uh, Labour Party of 1967. Now, I know there have been many changes in the uh, field of work. Uh, in 1967, uh, my father worked in a factory in which thousands of people went to work every day, every one of them a card-carrying member of the engineering union. I know that that kind of thing has changed. But nonetheless, the working class is still definable, still discernible, maybe like uh, the camel, easier to recognize than to define, but certainly easy to recognize. Mm. But you won't find it in the Labour Party, neither in Parliament, especially not in Parliament, but neither at the rank and file level. It's alien. Strange for a party that calls itself Labour, of course, but but I mean, and, and, and it's not just the lack of, uh, I suppose, working class voices within the party itself, but it, but it's, it also strikes me as a kind of a general attitude that a lot of the party seem to have, or a kind of, let's put it as this, like a kind of mistrust of working class people. I mean, I even would say that the this tendency uh, to smear uh, 17.4 million people as racist and stupid and, and the rest of it is part of this general disdain that you see for, for working class people and their, and their communities. Is, is, is that a fair assessment? Yes, and that's been going on for a, for a long time too. Uh, as I pointed out uh, rather presciently, actually, at the time of the Raoul Moat case, when Gaza was found in the woods, uh, bringing Raoul Moat uh, a, a fishing rod and a couple of cans of lager. Uh, the fact that Raoul Moat had clearly visible uh, support uh, from white working class people, not all of them, of course, but a lot of them, uh, was an indicator of the sense of alienation uh, being felt by white working class people in this country. The most oppressed people in this country are uh, poor working class boys. What do I mean by that? I mean that their attainment at school, uh, the social structures that are there to uh, protect them and support them and develop them uh, are less than any other community. Why do uh, some white working class people uh, dislike the Muslims, for example, that are living in the same area as them? Well, uh, some of the reasons are that Muslims have a society amongst themselves. They have a mosque, uh, they have uh, community organizations, they have affinities, they have extended families. Uh, they have things that white working class people living in the same constituency have long lost. If, if I give you the example of Dagenham, uh, 50 years ago, Dagenham had a giant Ford plant, like the plant that I talked of that my father worked in, uh, where everyone earned good money, everyone was in the transport union or the engineering union. It had a, a, a local authority swimming pool, local authority uh, community centers, thousands of local authority houses. Life was good for the working class in Dagenham 50 years ago. But it isn't now. All of those things have been taken away. And the people and their children, and now their children, are displaying the sometimes ugly fruits of that alienation. And that's what a Labour Party, a real Labour Party, would be highlighting, not talking about pronouns sex, gender, and other rock and roll. Well, also, I mean, phrases such as white privilege, which are, which have ended up actually very much muddying policy decisions. Um, and, and I suppose advancing the idea that we shouldn't really feel sorry for these people who are on the poverty line and going to food banks. But phrases such as that do create so much resentment. And, and as you seem to imply there, that they see these other communities who are 
who are enjoying their uh, traditions and solidarity and all the rest of it. And, 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 and that might be why resentment escalates and sometimes comes out in those ugly uh, racist ways on occasion. Yes, quite. And the job of a Labour Party is to unite uh, those uh, communities, to fight for each of them equally, uh, to make sure that each of them understands and feels that Labour is on their side. But working class people in Britain uh, long ceased to think of the Labour Party as being on their side. So I think to answer your earlier question, uh, it's far too late uh, to go back. Labour will now be a party of uh, the inner city of some but not all ethnic minority communities and of university educated Guardian reading, uh, Channel 4 news watching, middle class people. And that ain't enough to form a majority. Never has been, never will be. To what extent do you think that the issue of uh, national pride, for instance, is something that, that affects these communities? Because I, I think back of, there has always been a, a, a socially conservative aspect to the left. Uh, you know, I think of, of George Orwell and uh, the line and the unicorn and the way that he expressed it in that is that it's always been part of it. And yeah, I think there's a mistrust amongst self-identified leftists of today against the idea of the nation or against the idea of, of traditional values. Look, look uh, Labour is perceived as hostile to the existence of armed forces. Uh, whereas, one look, I sat in Parliament, literally next to uh, Major Dennis Healy, who was a beach master at the landing at, in Anzio, in Italy, in the firestorm uh, of the Allied invasion of Italy in the Second World War. I talked to him personally and heard him state publicly uh, from his wartime experience. Mm. But his pride in having been a fighter in the anti-fascist war was palpable half a century later. Yeah. You wouldn't find Labour people talking about that now. When I raise the Second World War now, people, it's like faulty towers, people literally say, don't mention the war. Why do you right. keep bringing up the war? Why do you keep bringing up the Battle of Britain as our finest hour? Well, my answer is because it was our finest hour. And if it wasn't for that finest hour, we'd be having this conversation in German, except we'd all be dead for our <laughs> dissident uh, views. It's a little sad, so isn't it? That the, the Labour, idea... Labour has no patriotic credentials, no suppose... genuine love of the country. It shows. I suppose I understand the nervousness about when it goes too far, when it, when it sort of strays into jingoism and indeed xenophobia sure. and racism. And, and those are things that we obviously have to be wary of. But I think the idea of national uh, pride or the nation is actually a unifying idea, which would unify people of all colours and creeds, surely. Of course, look, we have to live where we are. Uh, we were not born in another era, in another place. Uh, and therefore, you know, a kind of uh, projection of ourselves onto uh, other places, uh, Venezuela or Cuba or Palestine or all the other uh, things that uh, preoccupy many on the left is it might make you feel good. My, you know, uh, nice music and colors and, uh, and virtue, uh, feeling of being uh, virtuous, but we have to live in the country we are in and in the time uh, that we are living. And if there is to be meaningful solidarity, from the British state to, for example, Palestine, you have to win control of the British state first. How do you win control of the British state? By persuading enough British people uh, that you should be entrusted with that power, with that control. And these two things can be antithetical. They can be contradictory. The more yes. you talked about Cuba, the less you were able to win power in Britain, yes. uh, if you know what I mean. So uh, it's a kind of adventurism. 
yeah. uh, that many left-wing people are involved in. They would like to have been born at another time, and they'd like to have been born in another place. Uh, but to constantly display that, whether explicitly or implicitly, makes the people amongst whom you actually live much less likely to trust and vote for you. I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about come back to this idea that the, the problem at the heart of the left is, a, is an inability uh, to reach out, to discuss openly, not to demonize others, uh, including the working class, but, but also their political opponents. Uh, and I think at the heart of it, a lot of it is there's a growing mistrust of the idea of free speech, open discussion. Uh, this is why I get very nervous about, about pushing for extra hate speech laws, which are open to all manner of uh, interpretation by whoever is in authority at any given time. Do you feel that that battle is being lost? I don't know. I think there's a, a backlash. Uh, I mean, the idea that we should give Mark Zuckerberg or big tech uh, as a whole uh, the power to abolish us in the political square, uh, um, led by the wise counsel, no doubt, uh, of Nick Clegg, Yes. Uh, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, if you're ready to hand over uh, your rights to speak uh, to Nick Clegg and Mark Zuckerberg, I'm not. And I think that there's a lot of people who agree with me on that. So uh, the idea that we should give the state, uh, and some of it is already given over to the state, Ofcom, for example, would ban this conversation if it were on a platform that they were able to ban. Uh, believe me, or I'll show you my scars. Uh, the power that we have been, uh, that we have given away already to people who are not worthy of that power. Nobody is worthy of that power. The reason I believe in free speech is, to paraphrase Mr. Churchill, it might be awful, but uh, it's better than, than all the other uh, yeah. forms uh, well, of I regulation. I do understand the nervousness when when people hear people saying racist and uh, sexist and horrible things. I understand the impulse to say, I wish that person would just be silenced. But the principle is so much bigger than that. I was very disturbed last week when uh, the Spectator uh, survey came out, which suggested, and I'm hoping this is just a, a rogue survey, but they, they, it came out that 40% of the population would be happy with the government censoring books if they were deemed to be racist, sexist, and homophobic. As you yourself will know, those words themselves are open to hugely vast different interpretations. And you know, a lot of the people who are called those things online are nothing of the kind. So that makes me very nervous when there is a growing public support for greater state control of what can be said. Uh, well, I hadn't seen that survey. It's dismaying indeed. Uh, I suppose we cling to the, uh, to the consolation that 60% were not. Yes. Uh, but it shows that we uh, we have nothing to be complacent about. Uh, you know, um, uh, was it the Milgram experiment showed that uh, rather a lot of people are ready to uh, continue turning a dial when they believe that they're inflicting electric torture mm -hmm. on someone? The Milgram experiment, it was called. So, uh, you know, there's now as queer as folk, mm -hmm. Andrew. Uh, yeah. We still have uh, a lot. Uh, to do in persuading people of uh, not the virtue of free speech, because as you say, it can be very, very ugly. Yeah. It's just less ugly than the alternatives. Yes, absolutely. So what's next for you, do you think? I mean, I, I know that you say that the, the Labour Party will never recapture uh, the working class. Obviously, you have the Workers' Party and you hope to do your best. But are we destined now for a uh, Tory government in perpetuity? I don't know about perpetuity, uh, but uh, certainly at the next election, there will be no Labour government. Mm. Uh, and that will make, what, 2010 to 2024, so 29, that will make uh, 20 years of Conservative government, uh, maybe more. Uh, that's dismaying. Uh, we're trying to build an alternative. I'm on television every night, uh, proselytizing for what I believe in. Uh, I'm making films. My latest film, Killing Kelly, is on the strange death of uh, Dr. David Kelly and the relationship of the Iraq war and the Blair government uh, to that mysterious death. 
so I'll keep doing uh, what I can, um, and we must hope uh, for better days. Uh, one of the uh, qualifications for being a socialist is to be an optimist. So I always uh, say this, if not me, then my sons and daughters, and luckily I've got six of those. Well, on that very lovely optimistic note, uh, we'll call it a day. Thank you so much for joining me today, George Galloway.